Thank you very much. Uh, while we're finding the talk, let me start. So my name, oh, well, as you know, is Rachel Cardell Oliver from Computer Science, and I'd like to talk about some work I'm doing with the Centre for Water Sensitive Cities. Now, at the beginning of a Perth winter, on a wet, well, not so wet, but on a wet night, it's hard to believe that we have a water crisis, but let me assure you we do. And in fact, the World Economic Forum has predicted that by 2015, we are going to be um, Uh, there's going to be a 40% shortfall globally in drinking water around the world. So it really is a crisis of quite serious proportions. In fact, they rank it in the top 10 risks, global risks in the world. So in the Australian context, why is that happening? And there's a number of things going on. Uh, one of them is population growth. So in our cities, uh, the, the graph on the top left there shows you the predicted population for our cities. Perth is the one on the far right, and our population is uh, predicted to double by 2061, so in the, over the next 50 years. But the same thing is happening around the country. So Sydney and Melbourne, who started next big, much bigger, are also predicted to double. So there's going to be a lot more people drinking what water there is. At the same time, rainfall is changing. Now, some parts of Australia are actually getting wetter, which is great. But if you look, the parts marked in brown on that map are the places that are getting drier. And if you think about where our capital cities are, they're all in the brown areas. So where we've got centers of population, we've got less water. Another thing, an interesting thing about water is that a lot of the infrastructure that supplies our water was built in the last 100 or the last 50 years. Some of you may recognize the photo on the top right. Um, it's workers laying the Kalgoorlie pipeline. So Perth to Kalgoorlie, we're um, delivering water. But that infrastructure is now aging and making it harder to uh, maintain and produce the water. And finally, the water industry, in line with all other industries, um, has rising costs and a lot of pressure, therefore, to make their operations more efficient. So that's the context in which I'm looking at how to save water, and I'll explain to you in a second what a computer scientist has to do with that. So I don't want, in the interest of simplifying this to 10 minutes, I don't want to leave you with the impression that it's a simple problem. It's not. It's a highly <coughs> complex problem, and the solutions are highly complex. And I just want to point you to a little bit of the solution that I'm contributing to um, in the research that I'm doing. And my part is about using less water. Okay, there's lots of interesting technical things we can do to improve the way we uh, get water to you, but we could also all use less. And I'm going to show you how. The first part is about collecting information. And the technology that's, the disruptive technology that's allowing this to happen is called smart meters. Now, a smart meter is not actually that smart. It's a normal meter plus communication. But it's that communication capability that makes all the difference. So a smart meter will gather information about the water you use each hour of the day, and once a day it will send that information back to the utility where the information can be analysed and either fed back to individuals or analysed at a population level. The second part of solving this problem is um, an area that's got lots of names at the moment, data science, data analytics. Um, I'll call my part of it data mining. So the work that our group does in computer science is filling in that box, is, is putting magic in that box in the middle, the data mining box. And what does that box do? Well, its input is raw smart meter data. Okay, so on the left, you can just see the readings that come in that tell you hourly water use from a household or from millions of households. That's coming in. What we want to come out, but that information is actually not of much use. In fact, I was just looking at a study today where they found that showing people their water usage didn't really help at all. You can only uh, do something about it if you've got actionable insights about that knowledge. So you've discovered knowledge from the input data. And that's the work that we're doing, uh, developing algorithms, computer algorithms to do that automatically. So the particular type of data mining I'd like to tell you about this evening is water use, habits. So what are habits? I've given you a couple of examples, and I hope you'll find these recognizable because that's the idea. So for example, and actually these are true examples. So I mean, they're taken from real studies. So 1,500 litres of water per hour 
every day, 5 a.m. in the morning, between November and April. Anyone recognize it? Yep. The articulation, absolutely. You've turned the watering on. Or 500, here's a hard one, 500 litres per hour every Tuesday and Saturday at 10 p.m. Obviously, that one's going to be a bit harder. It's going to depend on the person. I, had, I, told, I discussed this once in a meeting with a, a group of people, of, of men and women, and, I, and the example was Saturday morning, and all the women said, oh, yeah, that's doing the washing, and all the men said, uh -huh. <laughs> So these are personal. Um, why are we interested in habits? Well, the first thing is actually, I'm a computer scientist, but I went to the psychologists. And the psychologists who are working in the water behavior space said, well, actually, habits are really important in the psychology of changing. Because using less water, we can't do it with technology. We can't, well, we could give you less water, but that's not a very good solution. Um, so we actually have to convince people to use less water. So what sort of things are people going to be convinced by? Habits are a good place to start. The second thing about habits is that the ones that we're looking at, at least, use a lot of water. If you use 1,500 litres every day, that adds up pretty soon. And so that's an important, it's a good um, area to look for savings. Um, as I hope I've illustrated, they're good for human recognition um, and they're good for behaviour change. So let's look at the sort of results we get from that. So we've developed algorithms and actually the, the intellectual um, uh, interest there was finding the algorithms. There's actually quite a lot of hard computer science going on to do that. But once we've found them, these are the sorts of things we can do. So you've got, these are coming out, for example, this is a sample population of 500 people. And what we did was we ran that algorithm, picked up all the habits for each of those people, and then we plotted the results. Um, and now we're seeing patterns at a population level rather than at an individual level. So that's everybody from a group of users in a town in the Pilbara. And you can see each of the dots represents a habit. And on one side, the x-axis, that bottom axis there, tells you how frequent the habit is. So on the right-hand side are the people who are doing something every day, seven times a week. And on the left-hand side are the rare ones. And the line down the middle is actually the watering roster. So all across the state of Western Australia, there's a a legal requirement that you're supposed to water, in this case, fewer than every second day, so fewer than three and a half times a week. So if you're to the right of that line, you're actually, and it is watering, you're actually contravening the, lecture, the roster, and if you're on the left, you're okay. And then the, the y-axis is the intensity, the amount of water. So those big habits, 1,500 litres and things, are on the top. In fact, that graph goes all the way up. There's a couple up there at three or 4,000 litres an hour. Um, and the line in the middle is a sort of reasonable stopping place. So what can you do? So I was talking about actionable insights. What action can you take? If you're a water utility, you take that block up the top, the yellow one, and you send those people a letter or ring them up, just as you would if they had a leak. You say, what's going on here is the watering is too frequent, too much. Um, you could save a lot of money if we reduce that a bit. And your lawn would still be beautiful and green. As well as looking at the population level, we look at the individual. Because the temptation of this research is to say, oh yeah, now we found out what the average house in the Pilbara looks like, or the average household in Kalgoorlie looks like, or the average household in Brisbane. But in fact, there's no average household. Every household has its own behaviours, its own way of saving water, and another power of this technique is to feed back to the individuals what they're doing. So this is a house in the Pilbara, an anonymised, ethically protected house. Um, and there were some things that house did that were fairly typical. For example, 17 kilolitres of leaks over a year. That's, that's fairly typical. Certainly worth fixing, but it's not surprising. Um, the indoor use of 244 kilolitres is also reasonable. For a, it's a family of four, so that's a, a reasonable sort of usage, although, again, it can probably be reduced. But this house had two really surprising features. One of them is something I called anomalous peaks, so unusual, unexpected activity. And in this case, it was a 223 kilolitres. It was a huge amount of water um, in, in this exceptional behaviour, which would have been well worth picking up. Um, and the other one is watering uh, or irrigation type habit, the habits I was talking about, um, which were about 202. So this is the sort of um, personalised information that we'd love to get back. 
And I just want to finish with a, a thought for the evening. And that's, I've just returned from a study leave trip to Germany and Switzerland. And one of the things there I visit, did was visit a company at ETH in Zurich who make water meters. So they're working in this same space. How can we collect information about what people do and influence their behavior? And they do it using this um, rather cool water meter. And um, let me tell you what they discovered. So they were able to do this reduce water use and collect a lot of information about what people did and how they responded to feedback. And they found that young people, so that they're looking at the 20 to 29 age group, used 227%, so twice as much energy and water as older people. <laughs> they have higher shower frequency and their consumption per shower is 72% higher. Okay, so far no surprises. I'm partly telling this story because my son's in that age uh, in the room, so no surprises. But the surprise was that the younger people actually responded more strongly to feedback. So one of these in the shower really had a big effect to bring that down. And the other surprise was it wasn't just the green ones. It didn't depend on people's, you know, do you have good water saving attitudes? So that's good news for me because it means that it might be um, effective in some of these um, uh, possibly non water sensitive communities that we're looking at very high use in. Um, I haven't brought any handouts, but I'm a computer scientist, so I've brought you a web page. <laughs> um, if you'd like to find more about this, so we're just bringing out, we're just in the process of putting the final touches to it at the moment of bringing out a synthesis report. So this is where um, it's actually designed to be read, uh, not in a journal, but by practitioners. So I'd love if um, people to have a look at that. And on that website, there's also a lot of uh, fact sheets about the project and, and um, other information of that sort, as well, of course, as our journal papers that I hope you'd love to read. Thank you very much.